Well, Oki, uh, Nixikoa, Nistuni Daniko, Mogoyo Sukoyi, and we welcome you to our 28th week of Native Wellness uh, Power Hour. And today is a real special day because we have a guest from over at the Rosebud Reservation and all of his relatives over there. And we have a very um, beautiful uh, hour that we get to spend with you and it's just going to be like visiting you know just Indians listening to Indians and yeah. looking at mental health and well-being but uh before we start um I'll ask my nephew um if he would introduce himself and um start us with a prayer or a song or just so we could start in uh, a good way so I'll give it to you okay uh we'll be to me uh thank you my name is Greg Gray Cloud, uh, equine therapist at Tiwahe Kulukinipi, bringing families back to life for Santa Glasgow University program here on the Rosewood Reservation. <clears throat> um, I offer a song for us today, a song that says asking the creator, grandfather for help and uh, guidance. It's asking us, asking the creator to look after, look after us. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I um, I thought a Maryland circle eagle when you were singing because uh, when I was first uh, sobering up, she w used to have a lot of compassion and come to the treatment program and um, lead sweat for us. But anyway, when you were singing, I could hear her um, hear Maryland circle eagle singing. And you know what's interesting? I was before. Um, before we got uh, together here, I was thinking about Marlies and Albert White Hat, and um, you know when we were um, several times with Cecilia Fire Thunder, just a lot of um, Marlene Halgamo. I mean, there was just a lot of um, prayerful people, and and we'd get together over um, like around Mission, or, or we'd get together at Rosebud, and. Um, and I think it was Marlies. I mean, your, your boss. You, once yeah. you, you have to talk about your program, she invited um, us to come over and do a four-day uh, healing, like a Gona. And of course, Albert. You know, they're married, and um, Albert was just so um, just a unconditional loving person. But he used to tease you like heck. Like <laughs> he would tease you, like you know, to make you laugh at yourself when you're. They call it awatsops, or you just don't, when you're not acting right, you know, and uh, so um, Marlee said, you know, everybody had high reverence for, um, for Albert, you know, and um, we had started in the gym there, and um, here, um, they, uh, there was a funeral, so we were, st we were going to start, and then they were reeling in a casket, and we we're kind of like, uh-oh, <laughs> this is not, <laughs> we're not, this is, so then they, move us <laughs> they had to move us and Marlies and Albert they found us and they put us in the boys and girls club in the basement and it was a beautiful gathering but this is what I I'd like to and I said this earlier but I remember Albert and that you know and I see you as you're you're the Albert's not with us but I see you as one of the young men that's picking it up that's picking it up and going with the things that Albert and Marlies taught us. And 
so uh, I just start with that. <laughs> that was just so goofy that time because, uh, you know, we put him on the agenda. And, you know, sometimes when you put, um, you know, conduits or, you know, medicine people or you put the you put them on the agenda to say wise words. And um, anyway, the humor. So we put him on the agenda and everybody, you know, came in and we're all sitting in the circle. They started to smudge, you know, they had a opening prayer and all this and they bring Albert up. And so we're all, you know, just being super respectful and genuflecting and uh, and waiting for his wise words. And um, so I'm going to uh, let you do the voice since you do the voice. <laughs> So, so Albert takes his time. He slowly gets up. Okay, and uh, these are his wise words. Okay, so you you say the wise words. Well, uh, never miss an opportunity to use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> that almost makes me want to cry because he would. He that was his humor, and then he sat back down. And if you think about it, those are some damn good, <laughs> wise words. Yeah, wise. I mean, you get an opportunity, especially when you're in a speaking engagement and you got an opportunity, you don't take it, you're not going to use the bathroom for another hour or 45 minutes or so. <laughs> Very wise. <laughs> Very wise. So yeah. let's start. Let's start off with um, you introducing, you know, you, I know you came prepared and we, we, we talked about things, but I kind of want you just. To, to visit about what you do with these young men and what you do with your program. So for our listeners, you know, they, it might be their first time listening to you. So if you could kind of like give us the history and then we'll start from there, if that's okay. Okay. Um, so uh, Ty Kukinipi, I started working for them six, six years ago or so, maybe a little longer. Um, they have a, a horse ranch. Um, and that's when uh, Sam High Crane was working there. Um, and what, this program, Tiwahi Kukinipi, was started by uh, Marlise Whitehat and her husband, uh, the late Albert mm -hmm. Whitehat Sr. And, uh, and they got together and uh, they wanted to bring something back for children to bring a healing back. Uh, so that was the vision mm -hmm. and that was the goal. And I think the Glasgow University agreed to uh, house that program on their uh, property um, and so they started building and they started uh, building and making making some great uh, strides towards healing um, and uh, with utilizing Lakota horse culture Lakota teachings of our connection with the horses um, mm. they, they made some some big moves towards healing and finding helping helping a lot of relatives find healing um, and then when I started working for them Sam High Crane was just filtering out to go to a less labor intensive job. He was getting up there in age just a little bit, you know, and um, his relatives and family was encouraging him to not work so hard because he's an old Indian cowboy and he, was, <laughs> he worked all his life really hard. And you know how the, the old Indian yeah. cowboys are. <laughs> uh, so I learned from yeah. that. Uh, and, and so I work, uh, I started working there as a horse handler um, and learning from them under uh, Lakota teachings and called the horse culture and then um, kind of adopting and, and implementing that into uh, the, uh, the equine therapy that I provide today that uh, uh, me specifically uh, work with I specifically work with young boys victims of sexual trauma sexual assault young mm. boys who are abused mm -hmm. um, we have other therapists at the uh, out to the ranch with Tawai Kukinipi as well that see very very similar things which were uh, equine assisted learning based program mm -hmm. um, I use uh, healthy interactions with horses and how to caretake horses mm -hmm. with these young boys to locate and navigate uh, the, the, these young relatives um, through their their journey of healing um, from mm -hmm. assaults whether they be uh, from you know previous uh, a month ago a year ago or more recent current times but uh, mm -hmm. the boys they seem to take to the horses and give everything to them um, and they seem to allow the horse uh, a bound uh, through a boundary that they've built to protect themselves that the horse gets yeah. to see into that and so it's a pretty amazing journey to be able to watch and it's an amazing thing to be able to watch and help facilitate 
So um, I um, I understand. Can you just uh, give us a little uh, uh, that you just returned from the big Indian Relay Championship? <laughs> and, you know, like like our horse people, a lot of our teams around here went. And um, can you describe like how some of the young men that you, you were are working with are the the team that you took um, to you took second place? Can, tell us a little bit about that, please. Um, so yeah, we took second place at the world, uh, championships, uh, championships of champions, uh, Indian relay in Casper, Wyoming, uh, our young team, our rider 17, 18 years old. And our, this is our second year. Uh, last year we were rookies and didn't know what we were doing. We figured it out. Um, but, uh, really fostering while well, the boys that have come together. So that the team consists of, uh, boys from 17 to our 16 to 22. Them young men uh, have, are living together, they're learning together, they're growing together, um, fostering mm -hmm. healthy interactions within young men and young boys um, by using communication with them, uh, with the horses and learning what the horses uh, personalities are it really takes the team a lot further. And like I said, communication is, is huge whenever uh, we're dealing in even competition. It seems like uh, our, our training with our horses have been uh, talking with them daily, you know, going, going and of course, training and working and stuff, but uh, just spending time with them to communicate. And uh, the boys going up to that, I mean, it was exciting. We never thought we would be in the championships. We made it to the championships with our combined times. And it was, it was, uh, it was a pretty uh, amazing experience. I took video, it's on Facebook and stuff, and I'm like that exciting uncle. Like that the excited uncle, like, oh my God, I'm all freaking out when you're recording everything. <laughs> so you might want to put it on mute. Should anybody watch any of the uh, frontline relay highlights? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you. Because, you know, I was just thinking, you know, to, um, like you said, you were rookies and, and like, we're all, we're all rookies in this pandemic, you know, and we're, we're reconsidering as being our relationships um, with our significant others, with where we work, with our parents, our other relationships. Can you describe um, some of what your program, like um, so, some of the more uh, specifics of how, because I, I, you said 11-year-olds, you work with 11-year-olds, right? 12-year-old, 13-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Can you describe um, so that we could, in our audience and the people listening, could begin to think about how the things of what they need to bring into the lives of our young men so that they can um, mature, just make, be, be better men. Can you describe that for us? <clears throat> That's a lot to describe and I'll <laughs> give you my best shot. But yeah, we work with uh, young boys and girls. Me specifically, I work with young boys from uh, grades K to 12. Um, mm -hmm. The youngest boy that I have, I'm in about the youngest age that I, I really see around grade school age, fourth, fifth grade on up. Um, mm. When we utilize, when we utilize uh, uh, horses going into uh, communicating with, with another relative, with a brand new relative, and most of the time the children and relatives we work with haven't really ever spent time around horses and, and are usually, mm. uh, they seem uncomfortable around them because of their their mass, their size, mm. um, but we utilize uh, uh, when we we developed a, a way to connect horses with relatives, with people. Mm -hmm. um, we call it the spirit connection, mm. um, and so we allow it to be. Uh, we talk about when we're in the middle. We talk about vulnerability and, and listening to uh, the sounds of the horses and how they're they're responding to, to each other. Maybe their behaviors towards another horse um, to identify all those behaviors. We really foster. I mean, we really uh, help navigate emotions, emotions mm -hmm. and interactions and behaviors. Um, so whenever we dig further into communication, that the children, the relatives, uh, understand those types of uh, uh, emotions and feelings and stuff. But they're in a spirit connection. We run the horses around uh, the relatives while they feel all the energy that's created when the horses and <laughs> the relatives uh, the thunder beings are 
to create around you. Uh, and then once the horses, we stop the horses and we all, we'll all exit. And if the relative feels comfortable, I'll step away as a therapist or the therapist will step away. Mm. But uh, if they don't feel comfortable out there alone, then we kind of stay nearby and to a safe distance. But we really allow them their own space to feel vulnerable, to be vulnerable. Mm. Uh, and a lot of times the horses, uh, they sense, of, horses are reflective in energy. They're reflective in feelings. Uh, they're reflective of emotions. And so whenever the, there's a relative in the center that feels any type of emotion, there's a horse going to connect to that. So, mm. so there's only uh, one horse that chooses the relative in the middle uh, because that's the one horse that's most like the relative that's standing there to be connected. Um, and you'll see that how they work amongst each other too. The horses, um, they'll communicate with each other um, and they'll kind of start weeding themselves off and picking themselves off and saying that. <clears throat> and their behaviors, you can see them interact with each other and how I want this relative or this relative is most like me. And you can start to see that and then one will walk up to usually walk right up to the relative and not mm. to ask for their consent. And when mm. the relative gets good, their consent to touch, the relative, of course, will hug the horse's neck. And that right there is key. And I explain it to this point because that's key. Mm -hmm. um, that's key to finding healing in, <clears throat> in uh, finding healing in our trauma and the things that mm. happen to us in our lives because uh, once we allow somebody that space of vulnerability to feel that that's inside of us, and even mm -hmm. a horse, such a thing as big as a horse, you feel multiple things. Uh, the most, where, where I feel that it's really, really important for the relative to feel is that they actually feel wanted. Mm -hmm. That they were chosen by something or somebody because not for not because they, they can do something for somebody or they can become something for anything, but they, they were chosen by a horse that makes mm -hmm. makes a relative feel very special that you chose me, you want me. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes when you come from a community that, uh, and, uh, and the struggles that our people sometimes do face and a lot of times do face, the feeling of uh, being wanted or feeling wanted or needed is, uh, is absent. And so mm -hmm. that's very important there. So they build that really strong trust almost instantly. Um, mm -hmm. The next important thing where I, where I feel that it's very important is that they feel safe sharing those vulnerable emotions right mm -hmm. away. Uh, and mm -hmm. they understand what they are. They, they kind of recognize what they are when the horses display them for them in front of themselves. And so mm -hmm. from that point forward with, co with conversation, communication, and um, really directing uh, directing it's kind of like an interpreter how, how it works it's a little different and when you understand horse culture um, horses have a language um, and that language is uh, it's it's kind of tough to catch so you have to really watch it but I'm able to or we're able to communicate what the horse is is trying to give or share and relate to the relative and relaying those back mm -hmm. to find a healthy understanding and just watching body languages and, and breathing exercises and, and being able to uh, express when we feel afraid and, and not safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that sounds like um, such good um, communication. And, you know, and, uh, and sometimes, you know, like in the Indian way, they'll, um, you know, someone will talk about a dream and they'll say, or they were talking telepathy or, you know, or when they're fasting, they'll say voices came to them or are the, that, you know, plant like when we when you were singing, you know, I lit some of this um, bear root because this has been helping with a lot of the COVID, the breathing and the way you're describing these horses, you know, I, I could relate um, about how how you have to be patient when you're um, in a relationship with this plant. You know, and, and some people dream a plant, um, you know, or they dream when to harvest it or, or the plant talks to it. Like one, um, I'm a Ganax Demita, crazy dog in our, in our um, tribe. And a couple years ago, I dreamt about um, one of our plants and the plants talked to me and, and um, 
you know, in the dream, you know, it said, come get me today. And so, you know, I paused, I, I stopped all my work stuff. And so when we go out and this, I'm thinking this, this, you know, preparation with the relationship with the horse, like when we go out, you know, we're supposed to um, be in a good frame of mind. So, you know, smoke my personal pipe and kind of say my prayers and I got dressed because you should always get dress proper or you know sometimes it's adornment but the, it's just a plain you know a plain flower dress and your belt and um braid your hair because you're in ceremony with that plant because you respect that plant and you want to show your unconditional love for that plant that you um, go out there in a good way and ask put your tobacco down and ask permission to to take some but when i went out to get this plant this this time when i it, i dreamt about it when i got there i felt like it talked to me just like how you were saying the horses go out and pick and nudge and and um that plant um it said to me it said get some of that lake get some lake water and put it around me don't just dig me up because it said it really hurts if you just dig me up and it's dry you should be gentle you should pour that water around really slow and let it soak in so that when you harvest me it's not traumatic it really hurts if you just come out there and dig when it's dry and so i'm describing that can you describe i mean because you're saying um this um, you teach the emotions it's like in an emotional iq and i know because i've seen i've seen you i remember one time you know, we were NWI and we were all together and you had those and they were kind of novices, you know, around horses. And I seen you, you maneuver that that communication. And I seen one man um, and I'm just I, I want you just can you describe a little bit more? Because I think that that'll really help us think about our relationships and how we have to be vulnerable. And, and trust again. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because when I saw you doing that, I was just like, I was just like watching, you know, you could, you could, you saw the on scene and the spirit happen. So can you describe a little bit of that more um, for our audience? Yeah, so um, uh, the, the instance that I believe that you're talking about for the audience that doesn't understand or doesn't know of it uh, was a man who was reluctant to open himself up, but he he agreed to want to uh, start his healing, but he was reluctant mm -hmm. on to, to own some of the things that have, may have happened in his life. And, uh, and you can kind of see that on him and, and his body language and how he was a little stiff, but once that connection was made, he's seen that the horses were watching him. And once he was chosen, um, he understood that the horses did not want to be around him when he was, when you're feeling nervousness or anticipation or, or mm. anger or you, uh, uh, fear, when you were in that place of, of fear, um, you you act as a, as a predator, uh, and the horses, mm. you know, the horses they'll, they'll they'll pull away from that because when you're angry, you know, you try to push things away from you, and, and the horse will mm. stay away. And so this man, he's seen that once he understood and like allowed himself to feel those feelings of hurt, pain, and sadness, the horses began to trust him more and the horses then chose him with their noses to the ground, walked up to him and, and a horse chose him. Uh, and that, in that situation, um, that, that many of those uh, in every spirit connection happened that way. Like I said, it's really fast that the horse picks up and the relative will learn that if you use anger, sadness, fear, uh, any type of negative emotion and feeling uh, towards another entity or towards another person, or in this case, a horse, uh, mm. they're not going to want to trust you. They're not, they're not, they don't trust you, like I said, because you behave like a predator, uh, a predator animal, and, and that's going to fear scare them off but uh and so once you learn that um and, and oftentimes it's not even that they don't identify it right away as as a certain uh, feeling of 
anger or a certain feeling of sadness or a certain feeling of, uh, but they see it as, as just how they treat the horse, how when you treat mm -hmm. the horse with love and compassion, and oftentimes they don't even, like I said, identify those virtues or values. It's just how you, they, they work in creating that. And then afterwards you have that conversation when the horse was walking up to you, what were some of the things you were feeling? And oftentimes mm -hmm. the responses are, I was feeling, uh, people will share that they feel uh, not ashamed of what, of what, they, what is paining them. They're just feeling hurt from it, but they're wanting mm. love. And it's nine times out of 10, it's, it's because they were feeling they needed love and the horse was was showing them and, and, and they really said they felt that uh, you'll see that it, you feel the horse give you love when that happens um, then you start working around different questions that um, I would bring up uh, mm -hmm. to help identify and touch on certain other feelings and judging by their response to those feelings and what that brings up in their past the horse will also respond to that and so mm. it's it really helpful uh, when dealing in relationships to learn that how you feel about something that mm -hmm. that almost protrudes through the uh, your environment and, and other people will feel that. And so mm. when communicating, oftentimes it's healthier to use um, uh, feelings instead of like the coming from the place of feelings rather than of uh, anger and being blocked off and trying to push mm. forward. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of interesting because, um, you know, in all the, in our languages and in English language and all, there's all these descriptors of emotions, like there's thousands of words besides just sad, mad, glad, and, or anger. And it's interesting that, um, that that communication of um, whether it where it isn't words and you say of touch or of um, there's like that energy it's the on scene energy and you know when um you know I um, in my experience of working with um, children um, that um, their parents you know abandon them or they think they abandon them or they're just not there are there um, someone in their family has hurt them you know, and, and retrusting. And so you, this, you spoke about um, learning to, to send out energy of love and then talk about this ability to receive love, <laughs> you know, cause like we can, we can sometimes send it out, but, um, and I, can you talk a little bit about how you get some of these young men to, to like open up to, to receiving love? Are you know what like a, an example, or to tell their story? Like how do how do you open up to you know to, to let yourself be loved? You know, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, and the experiences that I learned, it, uh, how you how you mentioned, um, sometimes we can give love, but we don't know how to receive it. And in that statement alone, uh, in those feelings alone, uh, I've mm -hmm. learned. We might think we're giving love. Uh, uh, those who are mm. those who uh, have difficulty receiving love might uh, think that we're giving love out proportionately or healthily in a healthy way. Um, but I've learned that if uh, one cannot or doesn't know how or uh, feels uncomfortable receiving love, then what comes out in return is something again just to protect themselves or when they feel uncomfortable. They'll just start giving things and pushing things away or, or giving things away to people. And it's, and it's not necessarily, it is a place of love, but uh, it, it's an awkward thing. Uh, I think maybe in my experience with learning with, with kids, they want to give you stuff to try to learn mm. how, uh, learn how to love you um, and learn mm. how to receive that love as well. And so in working with those, with those relatives and horses, um, a horse is going to, as long as they, that you show that you're trusting and that you're vulnerable and that you're not going to hurt them, the horse will, will give you all of that love. And when the horse does, 
then you learn how to uh, receive it. The horse just wants to be there whenever, because the horse doesn't want nothing from you except for you to share with it. Your feelings and emotions. And so that process has happened. Uh, one really begins to at least understand and appreciation is, is how the very first starts. The very first start of uh, receiving love, what I've, what I've mm -hmm. learned is, is feeling appreciated. Appreciation between you and a partner, whether that partner be uh, your partner or a friend or a family member or a horse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I was um, I was thinking back. You know, our other, I'd like for you to meet Marcus Red Thunder sometime. And and uh, when we were working with a group of young boys, and and they, it's that new day kind of out of Billings, and uh, one of those old guys who's. Uh, kind of Vern mummy he um he did it with the horse but when we were first starting out we were kind of we were stumbling around because you know they'd give us these these young boys and young girls and they were so bruised you know they're um they were just bruised and so it was kind of we learned so much because um you know Marcus wanted to take them out into the wilderness and teach them how to survive and so they started out with like 21 days and, you know, um, then it was the counselors burnt out in 21 days because yeah. they couldn't hang, you know, and so, and then it was like 12 days. But um, I'm, I'm sharing this story because we found a formula of this learning to love or opening up. And I remember that, that group of, and they're, you know, they're like from um, Apsalaga, they're Crow and um, Northern Cheyenne and um up up this way and hill 57 they're kind of cree and uh blackfeet and uh sailors kootenai and and they all came um and they they decided to go out four days and i remember um it snow it snowed and they they thought they were gonna break camp and come in but those four boys in order to learn the beginning step or the mini steps of learning to let love in is um, they decided no matter what, they were gonna stay out there. And so they so they were learning survival. survival. So like, I remember um, hearing their stories because, you know, Marcus taught them to rope the branches of like the dried, the dried branches. And so they'd rope them and that's what they kept the dry branches for um, keeping the fire. Cause they had to keep the fire going the whole time, you know, cause it got cold and it was snowing and but that I just remember that group of boys, um, and then you know they're dealing with drugs and alcohol. They they all made a because of the brotherhood love. I I, th I don't know how else to describe it because of the brotherhood love. Even though these other adults or people didn't love them, their brotherhood was so strong. That group that stayed out there for four days and survived in the snow, um, they stayed sober longer. They, you know, and they had to make their own moccasins, you know, and, and you know, the never's having sewed, <laughs> they had to make a drum, they had to learn these things, you know, and I'm just sharing that story because I, I think that was one of the examples where I seen their, their heart was so damn hard, their, their heart was so hurt, it was just like an iron gate, it wasn't going to open up for nothing, yeah. and then, then you could just see it kind of creaking open. But I just remember the uh, beauty of their laugh when they were together and and they um, learned to sing like, you know, none of them could sing and, and they learned they were um, drumming and um, they learned one song. <laughs> so they, Marcus would take them around to all the powwows, they only knew one song and they would just sing <laughs> one song over and over. They knew one song, but I just it's remember that. That was how their heart opened up, you know, like witnessing and you could see when they were like a boy and you could start to see this man start to emerge. And so I know you have some of those stories. Can you share with us? Like, cause I know what you're doing over there. You could just see the look on their faces. Can you give us a couple examples of when they, they, they got to tell their story and how they began to, to move into their manhood? Yeah. Um, so personally, in my story that I can talk about um, when I first spirit connected, when I didn't spirit connect, but when I first really communicated with a horse and found that out at, uh, at a later age, um, a 
horse, the horse will turn a man into a boy. Mm. Uh, mm. The horse will take you back. So before you can move forward, get on the horse and ride them without any problems and, and ride forward before getting to there. There's many mm -hmm. other things that need to happen. So the mm. goal is healing, right? The goal is healing. And the healing is riding the horse forward on your journey and being able to mm -hmm. ride the horse without any problems. The process, though, on any man will turn you into back when, when you very first experienced trauma. Uh, the mm -hmm. horse will take you back to that point because oftentimes some of the things that are stopping us from growing and moving forward are the things, it's, it's trauma, it's called trauma, the things that have happened to us in our childhood. But you will go back there you're spending time with a horse, almost always you'll go back to uh, something that, that hurts you. And the horse won't allow you to, to go uh, forward until you deal with that. So um, when I talk about a horse uh, turning a man into a boy, um, so trauma had happened in, 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 in my childhood that I went back to. But what I went back to very first was my dad took me on a far side of a creek. It was in the winter time and uh, mm. it was cold. There wasn't too much snow on the ground, but I mean, it was cold. Um, but he took me to the far side of the creek, way up, uh, up north of us and dropped me off with a horse and said to find my way home. And he left mm. the suburban and he, he went home. I didn't know where we were going. I was just a little boy. And the horse kept wanting to do other things and kept wanting to ride other places and ride a certain direction. But me being a boy, I was afraid. I was scared. I'm by myself. Nobody wants me and I have to survive. So I was in that state of mind where I'm going to die if I stay out here longer. You know, I, I didn't know <laughs> how long it was going to take me or where I was. So I automatically thought I was going to die. So that instilled a lot of fear inside of me and that made my horse afraid. And I was trying to ride that horse and riding him on this creek and and not knowing what to do and fighting the horse and where to go because I wanted to make this turn, the horse wanted to turn over here. But it was a big deal to where I had to figure out mm -hmm. uh, being able to work that dynamic out with the horse and what that problem was. And I learned that once I calmed down and breathe and uh, trust the horse, that the horse will take me home. So I ended up making it back to the house. <laughs> and uh, by letting the horse lead me home oh, I, yeah. didn't know, I didn't know where I was going so the horse led me home um, so that was something that I went I went back to as a man when I went back to my childhood and I learned that if I want to begin my healing process uh, I must first uh, confront the things that, that have hurt me in my past because I didn't trust a lot of feelings. I didn't trust a lot of emotions, no matter who somebody was, if they made me feel a certain way, I would shut down and I would block them off and I would, I would just, I wouldn't grow, I wouldn't learn, I wouldn't anything because it was trauma. Mm. Um, and, and learning some of the things that people share whenever uh, they have spirit connected or some of the feelings that they get from having being chosen was, uh, was just a beautiful thing in our culture mm. that uh, we can connect with such a being um, and people oftentimes learn that what they learn with a horse they can they can practice with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know um, maybe we could um, talk a little bit about um, you know when we're relearning or we're learning to trust you know, because like um, in my work over the years, really, man, trust is hard to um, to to get for some Indian people, male and female. And, you know, a lot of the um, the women that I have worked with that, you know, have been sexually assaulted and when they're relearning to um, develop trust relationships, like we're, you know, we're just like 
teaching like basic things, you know, to go out on a date and don't have sex the first time, you know, <laughs> go out, go out and, you know, go out to dinner or go to a movie or go and walk down the street holding hands or you get to know and trust that person before you give your, give your the most intimate sacred part of your, your body and that, that retrusting and, I always ask, you know, women to make friends where there's, it's not romantic. It's just where you're learning, you're learning to make, you know, if you're a heterosexual or, or you're learning to make relationships where you get respect for each other. Mm-hmm. And, and um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like in some of the healing, like how, how, um, how can um, our young men begin to trust again? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, uh, so again, something I've learned about trust. Okay. Um, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, taught. So the way I look at it, because I didn't, I wasn't taught trust. I wasn't taught any other emotions and love and things like that from a man. That wasn't in my, that wasn't in my childhood. We look at boys in our current community that are learning to, be a man on their own or that basically don't don't know that transition. So we took it, take boys before puberty that are going through the puberty times of the, the change that the young men have. The puberty rights, because those aren't being explained to them, it's really confusing. And so mm-hmm. I was one of those boys. I was one of those boys that, that didn't get to have that conversation that learned learned on the go from friends that, that just would talk about certain things or how they did whatever, how they talked to women. And, but it was very, very difficult and awkward. I was a little awkward in dealing with that. Um, but culturally, culturally is a process that we go through. And yes, to learn that trust within, within uh, yourself to share with an intimate partner, um, I think should go back to course fathers who are on the reservation that aren't aren't very many and present in lives and there are some um, Mm -hmm. uncles as well uncles uh, will be the ones to to have that with uh, that 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 dynamic with nephews Um, and you know you and I have a have had conversation on this where you said uh, maybe young young people don't go to those people those those men those elders and have those conversations Personally, in my own experience, even if I wanted to go to them and have those conversations with men, there were none. Mm -hmm. There were none. And when you do find men that would have those types of conversations, oftentimes it was unhealthy conversations. Mm -hmm. They would tease, Mm -hmm. joke about, oh, you got to do this. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll show you how. I'll tell you how to do it. And it wasn't anything that was respectful. That's, that's just my truth. That's just my truth, mm-hmm. and and I know uh, you know there's there's things that there are people out there are men out there that can provide those to us that can have those conversations or should have those conversations. Um, but my own experience is yes, I would like to say that we need to uh, they need to come to us so we can have these conversations with them. Really, in my own feelings, like, you know, can you identify yourselves as that? Because I don't know who to go to to help me with mm-hmm. situations like that. And in my mm-hmm. puberty, I didn't know what I was doing. And so I ended up hurting people in the process and doing wrong in the process. So mm-hmm. personally, that's something that it's not something that I wanted to, I made it a thing to want to change. But personally, it's something that would have benefited me my own personal life if I there was there are men out there if there was men out there if you are a man out there um, Mm -hmm. you have understood those the struggles and of those dynamics in your own life then maybe we can maybe we can encourage ourselves to be what what we never had growing up Mm -hmm. I was was somebody safe to talk about about things without feeling shame 
Cecilia mm-hmm. Fire Thunder uh, <laughs> talks about that too. She talks about <laughs> sexualization. She talks about sexuality very openly, and it's <laughs> and it's something that um, uh, she does very very well. Um, she called myself my brother. I was at a conference out in uh, uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Yeah, <laughs> she was giving this. She was giving this conversation. This this. Uh, she was a keynote speaker, so she was giving her speech and talking about. private parts of the, the different organs that men and women have and this and that. And my brother and I were getting ready to go and we're, we were up in a half hour to go to another presentation that we had to present. So we got up to slowly leave, you know, and auntie, she was up there and my nephew, they're probably going to fornicate right now. It's a very healthy thing. She said, I was like, Oh, it's just silly. Um, no, we're not. We're not going to do that. So we sat back down and stayed that last 25 minutes of her presentation. And then we had like two and a half, three minutes to get to our presentation. <laughs> we were like, we got super shamed out. Like, oh God. But we didn't look that. And she, she, she went to us like that as an auntie and she had her point. Uh, and her point was, her point was, um, she said, my nephews, of course, you know, I love you, this and that. And, and, and thank you for letting me use you as an example. She's like, but because we don't have these types of conversation about sexualized, uh, sexualization or just the sexuality uh, with mm-hmm. intimate partners, she said, grown men, my nephews will get uncomfortable when talking about any type of fornication. Mm-hmm. And we're like, yeah, it's pretty uncomfortable. And, and she, but what, what she wanted, what her point was, was that if we just have them conversations, everything, I think we would be a little bit more healthier as intimate partners. Mm, yeah. Aim to share what we like and our interests are. And, but oftentimes it comes from a place of shame. Shame can sometimes be frustrating to deal with and we have to deal with. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, and thank you for reminding us, you know, that um, to move away from shame, you know, like, um, I was, I was thinking about some of my young relatives. They were asking me, cause like, you know, when um, powwow time, you know, powwow time and you all have to share the same place where you shower. And uh, so a couple of my young relatives, they were, and cause we'd have outsiders come other tribes and they, and they started, we started this um, conversation of comfort. You know, they'd say, they said, auntie, you know, how, how come some women are so shamed? They just like hide their body and you know, and we're, we're all, we all have, anyway, they were just saying, you know, then, and they go, but we've been taught to the love our body, no matter what it looks like, like being, you know, to appreciate our body, that we're sacred, and that we're life givers, and so we, we started, um, so the conversation was around, well, why would someone feel like cover up, you know, with the towel, or just be so ashamed of their body, so we started and it was kind of interesting because as the pow as we went on, they were they were saying, you know, the more I do like myself or the more I have my own self-esteem and confidence, you know, I'm not, yeah, my body's not perfect, but it's my body. I love my body. And so we started that conversation. So what kind of um, I mean, I we need to start to talk about those kind of things, you know, and Cecilia, dang, I mean, it's just <laughs> Cecilia can tell hickey stories and just just oh, get I'll into it. Yeah, I'll find stuff and be completely Yeah. Yeah. So um what up uh, so I better look. We got about 10 minutes. Let's let's talk about um healthy relationships. Let's you know, we talked we talked about a healthy relationship, you know, learning it through the horse. But what would you say, like something like, you know, courtship or how, how, when you're working with young men, how have you seen them start to move into healthier relationships? Can we talk a little bit about that in our remaining time? Mm -hmm. Um, So we have our summer camps, our two wife with Ruby. We have summer camps for young boys. We we partner with them, we child, we partner with the wife with Ruby. We offer one camp at the end of the summer. 
We mm-hmm. have uh, about four or five uh, young warriors camps. And they're not puberty camps or puberty rights or anything like that. They come, I call them uh, warriors camps, young warriors camps. We put mm-hmm. them up for the community for youth, young, young boys, um, from ages of 10 to 18. Uh, different groups, mm-hmm. right? Littles, mids, bigs. Uh, but in those camps, uh, we really teach the boys that we should develop skills as men, as Lakota, because those are things mm-hmm. that we take pride in. We should develop, mm-hmm. there, there's always a skill that somebody, that each individual is great at. There's always something that each individual is great at doing, and so we locate those. We help locate them within the young men, and they start developing their skills as young men and, and providers. Mm-hmm. So they'll just develop their skills in riding horse, they'll develop their skills in bow and arrow or lances, throwing lances, making lances, using the knife, whittling. Mm-hmm. And so the boys will do all these things on their own. They'll develop their own skills and each one will, will learn where they're great at. And then they'll support each other. They'll support each other in those, mm-hmm. those skill buildings. Um, and then, so the conversations that we're having with them are about then highlighting them. And so towards the end of the, the, uh, the week long camps, uh, we start having the conversations of now, how are you able to share those skills mm. how are you able to take those skills that you've learned and acquired to share them with somebody and so they would explain how they could share their skills that they've acquired and we would, we would ask them with who would you share those types of skills with mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of times the skills were you know how they can share them with were, were you know to provide for but we could probably hunt or and now we can make somebody something and we can make a gift for somebody or we can become bow makers or arrow or whatever it was. And we said, uh, who would you share that with? And most of the young men said, of course, their mothers, their grandmas, Mm -hmm. their aunties, Mm -hmm. the people who raised them, the women Mm -hmm. who raised them. And I said, well, who else is deserving of those skills? He said, well, their sisters or their cousins, they would say, or and so the older boys, uh, we would start getting into more deeper conversations about uh, you know, their intimate partners or if they have a girlfriend, they get all shy, of course, you know, but to help try to generate a better, a healthier understanding with young boys and young men to give towards their partners and women, um, they start learning that they are also just as worthy as their sisters just as worthy as mm-hmm. their aunties, just as worthy as their grandmothers and their moms um, at receiving those gifts, at receiving mm-hmm. those skills that they've acquired. Why? Because that's something that we should take pride in, of course, and that's something that defines who we are and how we are as young men, um, and that would attract and or acquire the, the type of partner that you're searching for. Um, so mm-hmm. the, the boys, they'll really learn how to uh, so it's always healthy conversation, but I, it's not at the end of the at the end of the camp. The goal is oh, I'll go find your we on, you know, I'll go find your woman. <laughs> but it's it's what girls deserve because you ask a young boy, do you, what you are like when the, you have conversations. The young boys have their conversations. Who oh, has a girlfriend? And they'll get shamed out and get teased. Um, and it's, I don't even like her. This and that. So they start putting them down to protect themselves. But whenever mm. they, they see it as something that uh, they've acquired, a skill that they've acquired that they're giving to somebody that's deserving, they also learn that you know, partners, girls are also that are not related to them are deserving as much as their own relations. So when they make those, those uh, when they relate the two, then they learn that, uh, I hope that they would learn that You know, as, you know, as, as you were describing, um, you know, that um, taking those skills from that warrior camp, I like that, that, you know, you call it a warrior camp and it isn't um, a rite of passage or any anything like that. But um, can you can you um, describe for us like a story? I mean, because we're getting a feel for your program some of the the healthier relationships are 
when when you can see some when someone's disciplined or someone is like trying to earn a relationship because like for a lot of women you have to earn them you know you have to earn them and it isn't like you you possess them like they're a commodity but maybe talking what are some healthy ways that um young men can earn their way into being a candidate for a long-term relationship well how did the can you talk about that earning it so um earning it personally in my own my own relationship with my partner corinne uh, rice she uh her and i uh has been a really a beautiful experience growing and learning with her um and feeling feeling uh, earned and her feeling you know earned as well like like it was it, it's exactly that you hit it right on the head and um, understanding that a relationship is is difficult but not difficult as, as far as like trying um, like physical difficulty it's more of learning how to understand like how you're saying developing things with your partner that you can experience together and um, if you have I look at maybe res relationships okay you take a res relationship where you'll move in together and shack up and you're together every single day every single day and you run out of things to do you run out of things to talk about uh, and um, you run out of things to share with each other um, and so as you you're not developing skills to uh, uh, share with one another, okay? They're them relationships and they grow tired. So then I look at maybe taking not breaks, but having separate interests. So you have other things that we do, we experience, we be a part of, we come back together, we have something to share with each other now. So it's not only just bringing excitement to a relationship, but it's like you said, Oh, this is what I went out and did today. This is what I. This is who I was with, and this is the, this is the outcome of what what we talked about, uh, and sharing those experiences and feeling proud of one another for sharing those experiences, or feeling uh, just as happy for one another when they experience different things that they can bring together and share. My partner and I, uh, have, I think, have had our uh, difficulties in those times, but also a lot of beautiful times. Where we, mm -hmm. we share things about things that we've done separately uh, or away from each other with each other and uh that is a big thing on on feeling loved that brings a feeling of love for one another and appreciation and i think it goes stems right back to that um feeling love or, or giving love and receiving love is two mm -hmm. different things and they're both skills to uh, mm -hmm. to learn mm -hmm. to build With the current situation in my, in my life, not current situation, but like with my life, my partner, um, those are things that we're understanding. And, and oftentimes, when we're working out or compromising, it's not very difficult to compromise because uh, we understand mm -hmm. where each other's coming from in a place of love, not the place of hurt or pain. And so mm -hmm. you're right in feeling, uh, acquiring those things and feeling earned. Like I, I hope yeah. that I, I'm earning my keep. And of course, my partner is is definitely earning hers. Yes, you know, um, I love um, how you're describing that that earning each other's love. I was just thinking, you know, you always have these uh, crazy uh, humorous thoughts. I remember my friend Lucy Little when she lived away from the res for a long time. She came back to Pine Ridge, and and I was just asking her. I said, "Well, have you went on any dates lately?" And she goes, "Oh, heck." Uh, the dates around here, they take you through the drive through and get a quart of beer. <laughs> she was, uh, this was back, you know, back in the 90s. And then I think about her saying that, you know, there wasn't um, this romanticism or this listening to each other or, you know, hearing about each other's day. All of these, you know, these steps about healthier relationships, you know. And, and so, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of our our hour here it, it seems like it went fast is there any closing um comments or reflection that you want to share out there because we're talking about mental health just some you know getting an emotional iq and um 
and especially during this pandemic, because we're all we're starting to reevaluate and transform ourselves. Is there any kind of closing comments you want to give to um, our group out there? You know, we got thousands of people watching this um, uh, as we wind down, um, and we appreciate you for what you've shared so far. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, in closing, uh, with dealing with things like currently, my girlfriend and I, my partner, we're we're on quarantine. We're, I was exposed, her and I were exposed to uh, positive COVID-19. Uh, and mm. so we, we put, got put on quarantine. Um, I got my test results back as negative. Um, we're waiting for my partners yet. But in this process of quarantining, um, we found ways to uh, navigate through now we're put on this quarantine and we can't go anywhere or do anything. So we found mm -hmm. ways to you know, make, make use, greater use of our time. And what I found that going back to who we are as, as indigenous people um, and practicing who you are as an indigenous person is very, very helpful. Um, developing those skills mm -hmm. as an indigenous person that you can uh, acquire at home, learn our games, learn things like that course you're crafting and stuff but it takes takes me back and, and, and uh, into finding a beauty finding an inspiration of, of beautiful uh, love with the emotions that mm. we can mm -hmm. share with one another when we create moments and uh, my partner mm -hmm. and I have definitely found times that are fun and that we shared together and teased about and did different things uh, so it's always finding finding yourself to share an experience in the most best way you can with mm -hmm. whoever the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the partner is, whether it be your partner or family or relative or friend, uh, is finding the most mm -hmm. healthy way to share that experience with one another. And those times are gonna be remembered and, and longer lasting. Mm. That, that sounds wonderful. So just, you know, just appreciating your partner and doing things and trying to create a happiness for them where it's a, a mutual happiness because I think some you know sometimes when you just allow your a partner to grow and they allow you to grow and there's there's mutual growth at the same time and nothing's stifled um well that's a, that's a good way to kind of maybe end our hour you know um our 28th week you know we thank you for coming on you know it's it's very valuable um, to listening to you and to listening to what you're doing with the young men and with horses. And so we'll have to, we'll have to have you on again. You know, this, uh, yeah. I feel peaceful, peaceful, just visiting. Don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> I, really enjoy your time. I really do enjoy your time. So thank you for having this and thank you for you and your team for providing a space like this for everybody to have a conversation and sit upon people having conversations about life and healthy choices. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And, um, thank for you know getting uh, always being the superwoman that gets us all together technologically well because <laughs> okay. he lives and i live in these places where we do, uh, sometimes don't get good wi-fi so just figuring out how to get us all on but we want to thank you very much and um you know these shirts like shift happens we'll we'll have to send we'll have to send you one two of them yeah, well, you know because shift, shift happens <laughs> are available on the website and Native Wellness Institute. We're on Monday through Friday um, at noon uh, Pacific Standard Time and um, we're on Mountain Time here. So would like to thank you for just listening to my nephew and um, just listening to um, me as I'm just I'm just trying to be a conduit so that we're healing together and and we're opening our ears and listening to each other. So we want to thank you for this hour and we're gonna um, you feel like um, singing a song to end us or you feel like saying a prayer because uh, you know uh, Aunt, auntie what would you, how would you like us to end yeah um, I just sing a, a, a song for us a, a gratitude a thank a, a wow. we call them a song of giving thanks mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, the song is, is giving thanks to the creator and maybe the things that we learned from, the things that we were, able, we were able to participate in and listen to and learn and experience and to, to grow from in this day. <clears throat> oh.
Away. So we'll um, we'll see you later. Giving you hugs and yes. thank you very much for joining with us. And um, we thank everyone who tuned in. And please share this with other people who want to just do some healing. So thank you very much. Take care of yourself, Auntie. Good to hear you. Good to see you. Uh, yeah.